so today we are going to talk about this and um, we started a four series webinar last month where we first talked about whether or not we're doing enough with our communities. Um, and now today, obviously, the focus is on conservation. And um, I am happy to say, and I'm now going to try to share my screen. For those of you that know me know this is always entertaining, um, but hopefully it won't be so entertaining this morning. Um, I'm really hoping, I, my God, I think this is working. I'm hoping you can see a PowerPoint slide. Somebody nod at me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, so I am lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Karen Millam, who many of you know, um, who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Species Survival Commission. And um, we need to be really, really, um, we're always nice to Kira because we love her, but we need to be even nicer than normal because Kira just got back to Australia um, after being in the US for several weeks. And I mean, like just, and it is now two o'clock in the morning, her time. And she got up to do this. So we must be nice to Kira. Um, <laughs> I'll talk to myself as much as anybody. Um, and so Kira and I are you going to be your trusty co-hosts um, for this um, session. And we are joined by um, three great panelists. Um, and first is uh, Dr. Christopher Kuhar, um, who many of you know, who is the um, director at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Um, and then um, we have a woman that I've just met and really, really am impressed with, um, and that is Sylvia alvarez Clare, um, who is the Director of Global Tree Conservation at the Morton Arboretum um, and is working closely with Shedd Aquarium um, and, um, um, uh, and with the SSC. Um, and then finally, um, uh, Valerie Peckham, who is the public programs manager at John James Audubon Center, Audubon Mid-Atlantic, and um, has been in the zoo and aquarium community and now is leading a great organization that is a combination of an you know, Audubon chapter, many chapters, regional chapters, as well as, um, you probably wouldn't call it this Valerie, but for want of a better phrase, and because it's still early in the morning for me, um, I'll call it nature center, but I know that's not really the right term. Um, so we have a great set of panelists, uh, but the first thing that we're gonna do um, is we are going to hear from you a little bit. And, um, and what we want you to do, and now I'm going to do something very entertaining, which is I'm going to try to toggle um, without losing screen sharing. Are you all with me? We're gonna do this, right? It's gonna work? Ah, oh, it didn't work, of course. Okay, I'll resume. I will now share my screen and go there. You know, um, I knew that was going to happen. Okay, now I need my glasses. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, Kristen. Um, this is so not your fault, it is so mine. Um, okay, so um, what we are gonna ask you to do, to answer two questions, and there must be a way to make this bigger. Well, So what we want you to do is we want you to go to www.menti.com and use the code that is on your screen, 56374177. And what we want you to do is answer the question of whether or not you think that mission-driven cultural attractions are doing enough for conservation. And we want you to use the one to five scale um, where one is definitely not and five is absolutely yes. And so, um, if you all can go ahead and do that, then I will be able to share your results and then we'll ask you the next question. Someone just asked what the code again is again. So Wayne, just ask. 56374177. Kristen, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Jackie, it seems like that mentee site is loading the second question. 
Um, well, it doesn't seem to be. So I'm getting on the scale. So let me show this to you. Yeah, if everyone just refreshes their screen, it'll take you back to the first question now. Thank you. And I believe you now see it. And we're still getting some responses. So I'm gonna give it a few more minutes. And the responses are still coming in. Okay, they seem to have slowed. Um, oh, a few more just popped in. Um, but my guess is, is we see more, we're probably going to see the same pattern. So it seems very clear that at this point, at least the folks on this, um, that responded on this webinar, nobody thinks we are absolutely doing enough. Um, a few think we're doing okay, doing um, pretty well. Um, obviously, most of us um, seem to be in the in the middle on this, and then a good number down to the other end of the scale. So I think that helps us think about. So you know, how are we actually doing um, here, and how do you all think? What do you all think? So this sets us up well for our conversation. Um, and I'm now going to the second question, which is, what should we be doing? Well, great thoughts. Be more strategic. That's a great idea. I like that. Working with communities more to address their needs, community-based co-design conservation work, uh, climate change, focusing on that, partnering, engaging um, social and environmental justice organizations, um, playing a more prominent role, doing more locally. And I'm assuming that that means locally where we're, our organizations are based in addition to um, where species might be. Um, uh, better stories, Consumer-based social marketing, social science, behavior change. So a lot of social science asks things here. Uh, more partnering, more engaging with our communities, um, uh, focusing on how we impact the world and, and connecting that to the uh, rest of the world. Um, connecting the environment to the economy and more engagement. So, and more storytelling. So lots of similarities will be compiling this and sending out the results of this to you all too, so you'll have it. Um, but great answers and, um, and really appreciate your thoughts. So now we are going to go to our esteemed panelists um, and I'm not gonna show their pictures um, because we'll be seeing them talk in just a moment. Um, and I'd rather see all of your beautiful faces. Uh, so, but let's go ahead and, um, and um, hear from our esteemed panelists. And so my, I'm, I'm going to ask you all basically the same question. I'm starting out with, um, you know, are we doing enough? Oh, and I should say Kira will be jumping in and asking questions, but she'll also be um, uh, responding to the panelists as they speak and, and adding her thoughts and comments as we go. Um, so so um, Dr. Kuhar, I'm going to start with you um, because I know that you have some opinions on this subject. Um, so could you tell us, do you think that we are all doing enough and why or why not? So I'm going to, I'm going to qualify this first because I want to make sure that everybody recognizes that we're doing a lot already, right? AZA accredited organizations alone are doing more than $200 million worth of conservation work annually. That's a billion dollars every five years. That's a lot. So when you ask the question, I wanna separate that from the question that are we doing enough to be justified? I think we are. I think we're doing a lot. We're doing more than any sort of similar conservation organizations. So that's a lot. But if you look at a million species threatened with extinction, when you look at what's happening in the environment, and when you look at, you know, I feel like the 
meteorology industry is like inventing words, bomb cyclones and atmospheric rivers and, and polar vortex. Those are words I never heard of before, right? So, but they're, they're describing what's actually happening. So when you look at that from that perspective, and if you ask whether or not we're in this to try and really make a difference in the world, to try to really prevent species extinction and provide environmental change, I would argue, no, we're not, because those things are continuing to happening. So even though we're doing a lot, we have to figure out a way to do more, in my opinion. Becky, can I ask a quick follow-up question of Chris? As you should, go for it. Chris, I totally understand why you jumped to this figure, and, I, and it's a challenge that we all have in the conservation communities, how to measure impact. But it was interesting for me that the first part of your response was a dollar spend figure. And I'd love to hear your reaction to kind of how do we, how do we, is dollar spent the best way we get that elevator pitch indicator of the impact of the work that we're having? Um, is it an adequate reflection of the impact we're having on saving species to talk about dollars spent? Uh, I, I would suggest no, but it's the easiest measurement we have, right? So we're, it's in many things that we do, it's easier to measure inputs than outputs. And that's really what we're measuring, right? We're measuring the input into the equation. Um, it's a lot harder, particularly when you're talking about conservation and climate change and things like that, which change over in a really extended period of time. And it's really difficult to say it's this one thing. It's this one thing that we did that made a difference. Um, so that's hard. Uh, but I think that if we start to, you know, this sort of gets into a series of other questions down the line, but I think we have to make partnerships and uh, approach issues that we can't necessarily say we did it. Um, so we're going to be looking at it from two different ways. Like there's always the part of zoos in particular, they're going to be looking at, are you justified in your existence? And so that's, that's that spend, right? That's the number we can provide today. But I think by partnering and getting into these larger issues, we'll have metrics that talk about the outputs, the successes, those are just going to be slower and we're never going to be able to say we did it, right? We as a okay. profession or we as an institution, that makes it a lot harder. Yeah. So you start talking about contribution rather than attribution when you get, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks so much. That's a great question and, and love that conversation. So now, Valerie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I agree and I would I would say you know, like, how do we qualify what we have, quote unquote, done, you know, sort of funding projects that, which is critical. And, and to Dr. Kahar's uh, point, you know, the millions, the billions of dollars that zoos and aquariums, you know, um, give to those field projects are critical to getting that work done. But are zoos really, you know, anybody theoretically could be giving funds to the same people. So how, how do zoos, you know, sort of differentiate themselves? And what is it that's unique about zoos that enables us to make to, to truly make a measurable um, uh, sort of in, impact? And of course, to me, the the answer is, you know, our audiences and that the power of being able to sort of um, mobilize uh, people and to be able to um, have, you know, sort of strategic, a lot of people have talked about strategy, like strategic collective action that's really, um, you know, sort of targeted and it's been um, thought out, uh, you know, from the perspective of the, of the issue. Like we were talking about before, I feel that, you know, kind of using the animals to tell the story of the issues that are threatening them. So that people, you know, sort of making a little bit of a pivot to, you know, you can help this animal by addressing this issue. And of course, climate is, is the big thing that's happening everywhere. And there are um, aspects of climate change, you know, that people are experiencing personally, no matter where they live. So it's certainly something that they can relate to. And, um, you know, it just it just feels like an opportunity to just have more of a, more of a deliberate issues based approach to the work that we're doing and um, highlighting the animals as being affected by those issues and, you know, building empathy and, and all of that. But then really sort of, um, you know, using that empathy with, you know, to get people to to do something that, that's measurable. The zoos can then say our audiences have done X and here's, you know, the impact of course, partnerships and, you know, a lot of things go into that. Great. Could not agree with you more. I, I 
wrote down the strategic collective action. I like that um, very much. So, um, so Sylvia, could you also talk about this and talk specifically, if you can, from the perspective of botanical gardens? Because we tend to, I know, um, we go back to zoos and aquariums all the time in our conversation, but this really is a broader conversation about what we all collectively can be doing. Right. Um, thank you. First of all, I do agree uh, absolutely with Christopher and Valerie that um, we are doing a lot. We really, I think, in most institutions right now, are very aware that we should be doing at least something. Um, but clearly, as a society, we're not doing enough. Uh, the trends and biodiversity loss are worse than ever. So clearly, we need like an all hands on deck approach with um, we are trying to maximize our impact. And I know that it is really difficult to measure it, um, like Christopher was saying, but I don't think we should be afraid of being bold and going for impact and measuring. So for example, in the um, botanic garden community, it's a little different. Like we don't have to justify our existence, right? We don't have, it's not the same as having animals in a zoo or an aquarium. Um, but we definitely uh, have to justify doing research or a conservation activities beyond, let's say, our gates. And I do think that we need to do that. I do think that we need to go. Um, actually, Jean Paul Rodriguez, the chair for the SEC, was just talking at that uh, meeting that Kira was last week about the biodiversity paradox. And I think this is something huge that we all should be addressing, which is how we have the majority of the funds and the institutional capability, training, scientific knowledge on the more developed part of the world. However, most of the biodiversity loss is on the global south and on um, upcoming economies. And so I feel that we have a huge uh, opportunity to go beyond our institutions and beyond our buildings to make an impact and partner with those smaller zoos, smaller aquariums, small botanic gardens in other parts of the world or community partners where we can actually support them by um, doing more uh, training, capacity building, but as true partners. And I think that that is when we can measure the impact and we can measure it with number of people trained, number of you know people that we are reaching out. So um, I think that we definitely can do more in, in that aspect. Great, Kira, any follow-up questions you wanna ask them? So many, and I think some of them will come out through the hour. And I, I just wanna point out as well that Jackie asked all of you to be kind to me, but not necessarily the other way around. So I have, I have free reign. <laughs> No, I'm mm. joking. Um, but I do. I have a follow up for. Um, I love all of the all of the points that have been made. I couldn't agree more with with all of them. Um, I have a question for Chris and and Valerie in particular. Of uh, Sylvia just made the point that botanic gardens haven't had to justify their existence quite so much as zoos. And I see in quite a lot of fora that I'm in that actually. And don't get me wrong, that zoos still are very much up against this real kind of real world criticism from lots of different camps, um, which I, I think is largely unjustified. But I also see in quite a few forums where it's led to zoos and aquariums becoming kind of defensive from the outset and almost cutting themselves out of some fora. Is that something that you've seen? Do you think that it's time for, as Sylvia says, to us to be more for us to be more bold um, as a community in the roles that you can and already are playing in this space? <laughs> Do you want me to go around? <laughs> I <don't. laughs> so, so I have the sort of luxury of um, being able to see this from both sides, I guess, and probably a lot of others do as well. But, you know, as, as Jackie mentioned, I worked at the Philadelphia Zoo for um, 20 years um, and, and I was their conservation program manager before coming to Audubon. And um, I do think that zoos um, can be a little insular in the way that they think and um, have had have also had the luxury of people coming to them you know people get excited oh the zoo you know like they you know he, like they're, they're frequently approached I mean I, I remember like our marketing people in particular practically beating people off with a stick because everybody wants access to our audiences and you know all that sort of thing and I think that there's 
I think that zoos might want to, I think that it would be helpful to think about the reverse where you're sort of going into the community and I don't, and sort of and other institutions, other entities that are working in, you know, in the, in the, in the environment in one shape, one way or another, municipalities, what have you, have a presence on committees, on working groups, on, you know, it's it's a way to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on, you know, sort of in your general surroundings. And and I guarantee as a zoo person, you will you will find connections. You'll see where you fit in with what others are doing. And that th th they would never have crossed their mind to like reach out to the zoo because you know it's so animals all the time. <laughs> it's just like a silly thing to say. But you know, like so much I, I feel like it's so often lost on people all the conservation work and all the you know the intention to you know address issues and all the, everything we're talking about people don't that's sort of missed by a lot of people so I just feel that there's a lot of opportunities for zoos to sort of like Sylvia was saying go beyond their institution be part of things in a in a different way and help people work on what they're doing and sort of find those synergies Sylvia, I'm betting question. you have some opinions on this as well, as does Chris. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, uh, I, I agree with what Valerie said. I think that, you know, in zoos, in some cases, we're, we're still paying for the sins of our predecessors from a public opinion standpoint, right? So I think that there is a little bit of uh, concern about that. And quite, quite frankly, we're still we're still trying to do better, right? We all have older exhibits that we're, that we're updating. We're still learning, right? So um, I think that's part of the issue. I think the other issue is that when you, when you look at the government structure of zoos and aquariums and, and probably botanic gardens and, and science museums, the nonprofit board structure does us no favors, right? So we're actually being run by bankers and entrepreneurs and lawyers who really don't understand this side of the business, their task, from a from a legal standpoint is to make sure our bottom line is good right make sure we're not losing money so they're paying attention to revenue and they're paying attention to public opinion and that's not what we're saying we're trying to do right so um in many cases they tend to react or maybe overreact to a public opinion poll or someone saying something about being anti-zoo and instead of focusing on how we make our mission right and how we do the right thing which will everything will take care of itself they tend to focus on that reaction or overreaction. And I think that drives all of us um, in a particular direction. And I think that makes it challenging. So completely agree, which really goes next to, uh, to my next question, um, which I'm going a little bit on a tangent from, from what we talked about. So my apologies um, immediately to you all is, so I think each of you has used the word bold. Um, and that being bold, um, I completely agree. I have said for a while, I've heard many people say for a while that there's a lot of money yeah. out there yeah. if we can come up with one big, bold idea that we could all do together. But that means it's got to be a big, bold idea that we all do together. Do you have any thoughts on how, because, well, first, do you think we have a global vision related to this? I'm going to guess you don't. Um, and and if not, how do we get that global vision? What would that what could that global vision look like? And Kira, I'm asking you too. You got to tell us who to speak next, Jackie, because we're all oh, just Chris. waiting with our hand on the mute button. <laughs> oh, good. You guys are so, oh, so, um, so um, Chris, I'm going to go with actually, I'm going to go with Sylvie because she didn't get to answer the last question. Um, okay, so, well, clearly, I think we don't have a global vision between zoos, aquariums, and botanic gardens, which I think is okay, because we are very different, but we definitely should try to work more together and find those points of conversion, like where we can all align on some themes, such as, as you were all describing, climate change, biodiversity loss and communicating stories, uh, things that we all share with our visitors and uh, the community where we are at. 
for the botanic garden community, I can say that um, we have like the equivalent of um, WASA or ACA, which is, um, well, we have several organizations. Like in the United States, there's APGA, right? The American Public Garden Association. But we also have BGCI, which is Botanic Garden Conservation International, which is amazing because it is a whole global network of botanic gardens just focused on conservation. So we have our own leaders, right, that are organizing us and bringing us together just towards conservation. And uh, I feel that they do a phenomenal job. A really good example that I think is a success story is that a couple of years ago, they started these uh, global conservation consortia for some key taxonomic groups of trees that cannot be seeded. And so there is now an each botanic garden um, around the world are leaders for that. So Atlanta Botanic Garden lead the Magnolia Consortium, and we at the Northern Arboretum lead the Global Conservation Consortium for Oak. And so this has been a huge platform, and it has been so helpful for uh, giving us uh, that strategic direction of what we're doing. We got funding, for example, from IMLS, which is the Institute for Museum uh, and Library Services, I think, which uh, for the SICAD um, uh, consortia, which is led by Montgomery Botanic Garden, the Magnolia in Atlanta and us for Oaks. And so now three gardens working together you know, towards promoting conservation of these key taxonomic groups, aligning efforts, talking about what works and what doesn't. So I think that that has been, and I know zoos and aquariums also have like a lot of partnership for some taxonomic groups, but I don't know if you have like a conservation specific network. So maybe that's a good idea, something, you know, that could be pursued. So um, Kira, I know you wanted to ask a follow-up question. Um, of Sylvia or no, no I'm, I'm with yeah. that one. I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear kind of Chris and, and Valerie's reactions to Sylvia's okay. comment. Yeah. Chris. So I, I guess the way I would answer that question is I think we have a, a unified vision, but I think it's the wrong one. I think that we, I think at some point we fell in love with a version of the Noah's Ark paradigm, right? So not that we're we're holding animals to put them back in the wild, but the focus <laughs> is all about the animal. The focus is is very narrow and it's explicitly on the animal. We we try to own the animal conservation space, but that's not how conservation works, right? And you could argue that animals are actually the output in this conservation, you know, discussion of evaluation, right? So I, I, from my perspective, I think we have to separate ourselves from the animal conservation message, which sounds completely backwards, but but the, the real issues are climate change. The real issues are habitat loss. The real issues are tree canopy. The real issues are connecting with our community to engage a, a group of people who aren't thinking about conservation in our, you know, most zoos are urban, right? And, and then we're asking, we're surprised that they're not paying attention to tiger conservation or gorilla conservation half a world away, right? That when we start making those conversations relevant, then I think we can have a global vision. But I think, again, going back, I think we're a little bit afraid because once you start talking about climate and once you start talking about connecting the environment to the economy, then you start running into politicians and you start running into community, you know, other other opinions. And I think we've been afraid of that. So to me, the, the bold piece of this is we have to figure out how to have a discussion around conservation that isn't animal focused. And but connects animals to it, and we're we're not there yet. I think you're starting to see individual organizations start to do that, but we haven't done that at, at a at a global level at to this point. Excellent and great great thoughts, um, Valerie, and then Kira will go to you. Oh my gosh, I could not agree with you more, Chris. <laughs> so I yeah, so so I would say that. Um, and I guess, you know, and one other thing I guess to add to, to everything that Chris was just saying is, you know, really tying, you know, these issues, not only to helping the animals, but to helping the people and to really trying to make it, make it relevant for the people themselves, which again, you know, thanks to climate change, which is really, you know, beyond in full swing now, people are actually uh, experiencing those effects. So um, I will say, so in, uh, one idea of, of mine has to do, of course, with the fact that now I'm with 
Audubon Mid-Atlantic, and we are um, a regional office of the National Audubon Society. Um, and so I, of course, I've never fully left zoos in my heart. So there's been a few things that um, I've been trying to do, you know, sort of connecting Audubon with zoos. And I, and I will say as, as, as NGOs go, like all the big household names, I feel like Audubon is um, pretty unique unless, uh, because we have such a grassroots um, component. You know, we have, like I work out of, out of an Audubon center, we have three centers within our region. You know, there are centers scattered throughout the country within state and regional um, offices. And um, it makes it, it gives us an opportunity to have that face-to-face -face, um, connection with people in the same way that zoos do. Um, so I do think that zoos working together with local Audubon um, offices and centers in particular um, could be a replicable sort of scalable model um, to sort to work on things that are you know of mutual interest. And I can just give um, a quick example. Like when I first started in this role, I did something with um, the Elmwood Park Zoo where basically uh, we used the scarlet tanager as the face of, it was all about native plants. It was talking about the importance of native plants to um, you know, climate and to managing watershed health, uh, particularly in a changing climate with all the excessive storms and flooding and things that go on. And so basically, um, you know, we had all these plants installed in front of an exhibit. It was a walkthrough exhibit of exotic birds, um, sun conures and I forget something else, but birds that are from like the Columbia um, area. And so the scarlet tanager, which winters with those birds, um, was, uh, but also depends on the stopover habitat provided by native plants to people who are living here. So the people here have a connection to scarlet tanagers and they recognize those. And so that was sort of the story of the exhibit. People had to wait in line to go in because it was a walkthrough. There was some, um, some stuff we were, the, the zoo trained their birds to do that, um, generated funds and we ended up raising $3,500, which was contributed by zoo visitors, which then instead of saying, okay, Audubon Minute Land is gonna go put this into their forest work because this was connected to our forest program. We okay. used that to host a municipal yeah. conference and offered mini grants to municipalities doing stormwater management work. So in this way, it was kind of, you know, the zoo community, the zoo visitors, you know, it was their contributions that raised this money and that went back into the places where they're living to address the same issues that we were talking about in the signage that are affecting scarlet tanagers passing through this area and the birds in that exhibit, you know, living down, you know, in, in, in Colombia. So I feel like birds in particular um, not to be, you know, <laughs> because they are everywhere and they, you know, and to, for, zoos, for zoos to sort of um, clump um, animals together in ecosystems and be able to talk about um, system impacts uh, is another is a way to do that. And we're sort of continuing to work on that same model, working with other zoos and doing different things even now. Love that as well. Um, and I'm so surprised that you are focusing on birds. It's so odd. Yeah. <laughs> um, and can I just say one really fast thing? <laughs> well, I've got everybody here. I know that there's like a, with the Save Project for Songbirds, I, I've seen just mentions here and there, and I'm certainly not in it. So I don't know what the latest thought is on like preparing to get songbirds into zoos. Please don't. I mean, that, that to me is like an opportunity to sort of be outside of yourselves. Talk about the, an animal that is everywhere. And link to it by by the story that I just told. But you know, rep, you know, and define. There are creative ways that you can reference songbirds with the animals that we currently have, and then say, and by the way, it's migration season. You can see them at home. <laughs> and then there's you know, sort of ways to keep that connection going with with the zoo, with the aquarium, with botanic gardens, plants, <laughs> um, when you're not physically there. So that it's a continuum. That visit is on a continuum of constantly engaging and connecting on these issues. I'm stopping. I'm sorry. No, no. I think that's a great point. Um, so, Kira, to you. Yeah, I mean, I think your original question and like this question was was around kind of should we have a global like a, 
big goal that we all pull towards. And I, I think my, my gut reaction is actually no, because I think where we should be working is in the unique strengths and, and skill sets and opportunities that each of your communities and individual institutions and partnerships that you can create have. And I also think we've had some mention already on the call about the insular nature that we all tend to fall into. I think I also want to say that the last question of are we doing enough, I think most of the communities working in conservation in some way would have a similar graph to what we saw. None of us feel like we're doing enough. This is not unique to cultural institutions. The, and the, the evidence is clear that as a world, we're not doing enough. But I also think we all have a tendency in our different sectors or our different parts of the conservation community to reinvent the wheel too often. 196 countries came together under the United Nations banner over the last three years and just set global goals and targets for conservation. We don't need to set more goals. We just need to figure out how to be more a strategic part of those goals. Um, and in the future, be more at the table deciding on those goals as well. And I think from a species conservation perspective, and I know we're talking much more broadly than that, but I'm really excited because for the first time, this is a low bar, but for the first time we saw a target that was set that wasn't just about avoiding irreversible catastrophic failure. We set a target that wasn't just about ending extinctions, but reversing declines and having thriving populations. And so I love Chris's point of um, it's become too animal centric and we shouldn't focus just on the animals that that is an output and a measure of success is, is having thriving populations, but we shouldn't focus exclusively on that. And certainly we need to be bringing more social science and looking at the community levers and the role that communities and people play in saving nature. Um, but I also would hate for us to swing too far the other in the other direction, where we disconnect from the unique role that cultural institutions can play between species and people. And so I think um, there are many, many organizations that are taking on things like climate change. And so I do think that we should be looking at climate change. It's such an enormous threat, like, like Chris was saying, those threats like habitat loss and climate change and over-exploitation but really looking at the unique intersection that cultural institutions can play between those two. And so looking at those species that are threatened by socially driven threats and looking at the levers where you can have the biggest impact. And I wanted to do a follow-up question to the three panelists around how do we leapfrog over the learning period and the evolution that naturally comes when institutions start engaging more in socially driven threats and addressing those? How do we leapfrog over the really tokenistic actions like no offense to anyone on the call that does this, but like avoiding plastic straws. I mean, we're not going to save the world by spending the next decade asking people to avoid plastic straws. How do we find that? How do we be braver? How do we partner more? And how do we look for those levers where we can shift the corporate investments and the corporate decision making and the legislative frameworks and the holistic community actions and social movements in a way that's not just these individual one-off behaviors that people can take that is going to take us another three decades to see the impact of. Is that? So I love that question before you answer what I've been thinking a lot about the approach that we're trying to take to issues of social and environmental justice is very much a systems approach. It's really looking at what are the systemic differences that we can make. But to Kira's point, when you think about we're doing, and just as Chris said earlier, we are doing so much more in the behavior change and social science area than we ever have within our organizations. And so kudos to everybody that is doing that. But we do tend to still be at the stage of focusing on individual behavior change instead of systemic issues. So with that, if the three of you could answer the question of how we do this, that would be great. And you've got 30 seconds, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Valerie. Oh, okay. So I was just laughing. So uh, I would say two things off the top of my head. Um, so I would say the question to me is sort of so much of what you're saying, Kira, is about consumer demand. That's what's driving and the behaviors that we, I mean, so the behavior change for our guests is making different, you know, consumer choices, I suppose. And ultimately, though it's corporations and industries that have to change with their practices um, because at the end of the day that's what's deforesting and polluting and and everything else so you know so, so to me I mean that, talk about like that here's like a massive I mean I think about when I did a lot of work with the palm oil um, industry and that was all about 
getting corporations to, you know, commit to deforestation free palm oil and then to have measurable, you know, milestones and just on and on and on. Right. And, and so I think that it's important to really get specific about like, you know, what industry, who, who, who is it that we want farms, maybe agriculture with the farm bill. I mean, you know, there's, there's, and then just continue to like drill down to like what what are all the pieces of that and this requires working with other organizations that have a lot of expertise and and are working on these issues and finding again where where is the role of zoos and like how can we advance this work that we but we all want and so often it boils down to like all of our audiences sort of moving in the same direction and we did try to do a lot of that with 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 the palm oil piece, but but it has to be. It can't just be. Uh, it really does have to be directed. And it was a good cop, bad cop. Zoos were always the good cop, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but I do think that um, yeah, we, we just have to sort of be clear about whose whose behavior ultimately we're trying to change. Yeah, so identifying specific is. levers and then leveraging the community impact that you can have on those specific levers. Love it. That's great. Thanks, Bella. Sylvia. Yeah, this is this is a tough one. I mean, like if we knew we would already be doing it, right? <laughs> I I do think that whatever each organization does has to make sense. It has to make sense for them, for their mission, for the place where they're located, for the animals or plants that they have, because then it's gonna come authentic and it's gonna be real. Like, I think if, for example, for us at Morton Arboretum, we're all about oaks. Oaks are the most important tree in the United States by basal area. We, the tree, like state tree of Illinois is the white oak, and we have the largest oak collection of any botanic garden in the world. So it makes sense that we are trying to do work. Where are the most endangered oaks in the world? In Mexico, in Latin America and Southeast Asia. So that's exactly where we're working. It makes sense for us. I'm from Costa Rica. I'm working in Costa Rica. I have absolutely feel comfortable going there and telling people we got to do this because, you know, I'm from there. So I think that it has to make sense for the institution. Like if you have tigers, maybe you should be working where the tigers are, or rhinos, or, you know, if you are an aquarium where you have fish collection. I feel that when institutions do that, it comes out as real and people you know love the stories and and they're gonna follow you and it can be um as valerie was saying it can be also local work here at the arboretum we also have work a lot in that we our whole program is called the chicago region tree initiative and it's all, all about urban canopy in the chicago land area because we are in one in a big city right so i think that there should not be only like one answer for all it should be Yes, a common theme, but it should be targeted because conservation happens on the ground. It happens specifically. And if there is one thing that I would love to tell to the zoo and aquarium communities, like when I went to grad school and I wanted to do conservation, my advisor said, oh, no, 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 no. You need to first do your science. You need to become a PhD and a postdoc and all these 20 years later or nobody will listen to you. And I was like, I'm coming from Costa Rica, all confused. And I'm like, okay. And now I'm so mad. I'm like, I should have been doing conservation from the beginning, you know. But I, I was told that people at universities did not do conservation, that that was for somebody else. And now you go to aquariums and zoos and botanic gardens. I'm like, oh, no, we tell the stories, but that's for somebody else. Like the action of the Assess Plan Act is for somebody else. I'm like, well, who? Who is gonna do it if it is not us? Like, yes, we can do some assess. Yes, we can do planning. But if we're waiting until we assess and plan all the species of the world, they're gonna be gone before we get to the action. So I think we should be doing at the same time as the assess and the planning, absolutely the action. Because if it's not us, then who else is gonna do it? Completely agree. Agree. Absolutely. Um, Chris, your turn. Yeah, so um, and I'm going to say this is also going to be our last question of the panelists, and then we have a few minutes where we can open it up to the broader group. So I, I first of all, I couldn't agree more with what Sylvia just said, and I, I want to go back to something that Valerie said earlier about songbirds, and uh, I'll say what what we can't do. And again, this is going to sound dumb, but uh, we we can't focus on empathy 
uh, at this, our, our focus to try to get people to love animals. There's a bajillion dollar pet industry out there. People love animals, right? And there are some major conservation issues that are being compounded because people love animals, right? Songbirds are being decimated by feral cats, but try to get a community to, to, to take the cats out of the population, right? That, that you're, you're, that's an uphill battle. There's, I would argue that forests in the Midwest and the Northeast are standing dead because of white-tailed deer populations that are just decimating everything below six feet tall, right? So I'm not sure that empathy is the pathway to get there, but it's just like Sylvia said in terms of why universities don't like conservation, because it's hard to measure. We do the we do these small actions because they're easy to measure. Like it, it shade grown coffee is the you know is the example that I you know pick on all the time in my organization. We're not saving the world by get convincing people to grow to to drink shade grown coffee. Like if we wanted to do something, we should maybe convince them not to drink coffee. But that's not going to go anywhere, right? So I think that what we're trying to figure out is what's the small action that can lead, that we can do. We're, we're always gonna do those small actions and that's okay. But how do we build into a big action? And I would argue that the small action that's the most powerful is get people to vote, right? To get people, if you can convince our population to vote, that's the single biggest action that we can get our, our, our visitors to take. Because for those of you who don't have to deal with a levy like we do, politicians only survey those who are frequent voters. If you vote once every five years, if you're a registered voter and you're not a frequent voter, they don't care what you think. That, that's, the, that's the reality of it, right? From a policy perspective, from an election perspective, if, you, if your staff isn't voting, if your members aren't voting, if your guests aren't voting, none of these issues that we're talking about are elevating to a politician level. And I would argue that's the one way that we can make the biggest impact is to have an advocacy voice and, have, and, and that the politicians actually pay attention to us. Because right now they don't. We're the, we're, the, we're the nice science nonprofits, right, that they pat on the head. They don't really respect us in terms of influencing what they can do. And I would argue that if we have a simple action, just get people out there to vote so that they show up and people ask them questions. So all of this other environmental knowledge that we're creating, environmental will that we're creating, shows up in, in that conversation because it's, it's, it's hard, right? We're, we're playing the long game and this short-term measurement thing keeps, um, it keeps hamstringing us. So I completely agree. And so now we have time for probably one or two, oh, one comment probably from our audience. I'm so sorry. Um, so Wayne put a great note in here about the ACP. And so I was going to give him the opportunity to talk a bit more about that. And then we also have several, we have other comments about determining really what the small actions are that actually lead to the bigger actions. So um, Wayne or Cassie or anybody else, anybody want to make a comment or ask a question? Yeah, I, I can comment real fast on the the ACP partnership. Um, we've talked about it quite a bit uh, in in different avenues with the Green Scientific Advisory Group. And apologies, my name is Wayne Warrington. I'm a steering committee member with the Green Scientific Advisory Group. Um, and so we've been trying to highlight this as one of these efforts uh, from a collective stance of changing emissions within the organization, connecting our operational outputs, in this case, uh, our emissions, and reducing those as a part of a collective effort. Aquariums are doing a great job. Uh, it'd be awesome if we could find some zoos that are also interested in being able to find that, uh, that collective partnership uh, and work towards it. There are examples of institutions like Cincinnati that are taking great immediate strides in that space, uh, but it's that collective piece of being able to partner together and showcase it as an effort that would really uh, help to accelerate it overall. Thanks, Jackie. No, no, thank you. Um, one last comment from or question from anybody out there, and then I'm going to ask Kira to close us. Oh, I know you all have opinions because I know you. No comments. Okay. Uh, I have a question no, Travis. for the group. Do we need, we, the zoo practitioners and botanic garden okay. practitioners and so on? Do we need to be the ones figuring out the actions that need to be done? Or are there probably groups within our communities who are uh, more connected to the things they care about? Um, it's something I think about a lot in my role as a community science coordinator. It's a great question. Um, Kira, do you wanna take that one or you want me to throw in a couple of comments first? No, you can, you can first, yeah. 
So I think of that, in, I love that. Um, I think that's a great point. And I think it, that, that in two ways. One is from sort of the big picture perspective, which is there are organizations like Rare out there that are really do, I mean, this is where they live, right? This is, and they have a lot of research that they put into really understanding what are the behaviors that lead to other behaviors um, in this space. And so one thing I think about is working with organizations like that. So we don't have to do all of the stuff that others have already done. And then I think the other piece you're talking about I think is really working with your local community to understand what they want to focus on and then focusing on that because if you all want to do it you'll there will be movement so um so I think that's great um and so I'm now going to turn it to care for some closing remarks yeah I think there's some really strong amazing themes coming out of this discussion which are wonderful and it'll be great to great to find ways to follow up um I think a lot of the discussion has been really continually coming back to know your community and meet them where they're at but then find ways that we can that we can move the right levers to have a bigger impact. So no one's saying that kind of individual actions aren't important and a really great way to engage with your community if you can find those actions that are relevant to them, whether it's your community or your political constituents um, or your corporations, finding what's important to them, but then figuring out how you can use those individual actions to ladder up and scale up to big impact. And I think we all know that. It's just figuring out what those are. It's not an easy task. And I think although we said um, kind of resoundingly across the, the panelists that, that there are lots of different approaches to this, there are lots of different priorities with different organisations and different communities and different political constituents, but finding ways that we can leverage our co collective power is, is important. So we need to have flexibility and find these issues and these themes where we can engage with politicians, where we can engage with corporations and, and market, market demands, um, as well as make things relevant to our local communities. But we have to do that within the, the, within the framework of finding our unique strengths as organizations, as a community, between that intersection between people and species and really really bringing people more central to the to the discussion and the solutions um, but also for our own institutions and our own our own communities that we work within and so I think I mean I think even just having these discussions are a huge move in the right direction I think Chris made an important point that many of us are still apologizing for the sins of our forebears um, and it's time to move beyond that it's time to be more optimistic I think we know how to save species we know how to engage communities we know how to get the year of politicians we just need to be doing it more strategically and more optimistically I think we spend far too long apologizing for things that we've done wrong in the past or defending the role that we can play rather than celebrating the roles that we are playing and leveraging those for greater impact and I think um you know we're we also need to figure out how to get beyond the choir because this group I think is you know pulling in the right direction and um, we just need to broaden that broaden that pool and and continue doing the work that we're doing but find ways to scale up strategically so some really fantastic thoughts and, and really wonderful to be a part of this discussion thanks for inviting me Jackie Oh my God, thank you for being here. So, and thank you, Kira, for being um, my co-host. Um, and thank you to you, our panelists. You guys were as incredible as I thought you would be. Um, and thank you all to the audience as a whole. And um, yes, we are, for one of the questions that was added, we will be sending out a link to the transcript of the conversation as well as the information that was in the chats and the notes from the polling questions. Um, so, um, so I think that is it. Thank you all for participating. I think um, one of the things I'm taking from Kira's comments is the importance of being hopeful and looking towards a positive view of the future. Um, and I think if we can all figure how to do that will be much more successful. So thank you all very, very much. Um, go save the world, please. Thanks, everyone.